Welcome to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have real, honest, smart, and sometimes even hilarious conversations about co-parenting, separation, and divorce, and all that goes along with that. I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, Certified Life and Relationship Coach, and Happily Divorced Mom, who helps women decide if they should stay in or leave their marriages, and then guides them through the process one step at a time. Hey everyone, how's it going? I am so happy to be here today to bring you another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. And today's guest lights me up. Uh, But before I tell you about my guest, um, I want to tell you, I just got back from a super whirlwind trip to Madrid. One of my best friends from elementary school was getting married. Uh, It was her second marriage. And she, on sort of on a lark, said, "Listen, guys, I'm this. I'm getting married. I can't get married without you because we were all bridesmaids in her first wedding. This is all of my elementary school friends, and it, because it was February and the rates were it was off season, the rates were totally reasonable. We all ended up going. There were seven of us there. But the the reason I'm telling you this is because every one of my friends is happily married, like super happily married. I've never seen anything like it." <laughs> That's not true. I have. Um, But because I'm usually steeped in divorce and unhappy relationships and various forms of emotional abuse and things like that, um, it's easy for me to lose sight. And I think this is true for for many people who are in this. It's easy for us to lose sight of how much love and happiness is actually out there. And I wanted to bring you this message of hope because It was, I literally felt like I got a mainline IV injection, an infusion of love and hope over the last five days. And often when I'm in these situations, I feel really shitty. I feel sorry for myself and I just feel jaded and cynical and like everybody else gets it, you know, and, but I got to tell you, I was surrounded by people who've been married for over 50 years, people who've been married for over 20 years. And it was just... Oh, it was, like I said, like a mainline infusion of love and hope. And I just wanted to bring that back to you. I wanted to tell you how much love is out there, how possible it is for us to find love, to create love, because really that's what we do. We create love. We create relationships through super duper hard work. And most of the time that is working on ourselves to heal our pasts so that we can be the kinds of people who can have healthy relationships. And speaking of which, this is a beautiful place for me to tell you that my group program that I've been talking about for months and months and months, should I stay or should I go, is open for enrollment. Woohoo! We start on March 4th, Monday, March 4th, and enrollment is open through uh, March 1st, Friday, March 1st. Um, there's still some spots available, so you can find the link to read all about it and join it in the show notes. Uh, you can also find it on my website, kateanthony.com. It's under the work with me tab. It's the should I stay or should I go group program. And I'm super excited about it. This program has been my baby for the better part of a year. I've been working on putting this together. And so it's just, it fills me with all kinds of joy to bring it to the world and to finally have it finally be here um, for all of you to consume. So please go ahead and check that out. And one of the things that I've done in this program is that I've brought in guest experts. I've brought in about nine or 10 guest experts to talk about areas in which they are experts. <laughs> um, because while I know a lot about a lot of things, um, I'm not necessarily an expert in every single thing. I'm an expert in a lot, uh, but not everything. So I like to bring in people who are experts in certain areas. And one of the experts that I brought in is today's guest, Sylvie Kukasian. Sylvie is a marriage and family therapist, and she is an expert in attachment styles. And 
Attachment styles are somewhat of a new science that's really important in understanding how we operate in relationships. I always talk about how, you know, we need to understand our own operating systems. And this is such a huge part of it. How we were, how we bonded um, in our early infancy really determines how we end up attaching later on to people in our lives. And Sylvie has studied this extensively. It is super important. It's super important for us to understand how, not only how we attach, but also how our partners attach. And if our styles are different, um, how to work with that. It doesn't mean like, oh, we have different attachment styles. We're fucked. Like, no, there are ways to work with all of it. And Sylvie is here to talk to us about how to do that. So without further ado, I bring you Sylvie Kukasian. I am so excited to have this conversation with you. I have been looking forward to this for a long time. Yay, I'm so thrilled to be here. You are, among other things, because you are so many things, um, you are an expert in attachment styles. So I want to have like a really rich conversation about attachment styles. And for those of my um, listeners who may not know what attachment styles are, can you give us sort of a, a brief rundown about what we're talking about? Absolutely. Um, I'll give you just like the, the main framework for it in the most simple, simplistic way that uh, mm-hmm. I think it'll be really easy for people to understand. So essentially, the st- attachment styles is a framework that um, John Bowlby created that paid attention to the way that little infants and babies bonded with their primary caregivers, which usually is their mother, but it doesn't have to be. Whoever was the main person in charge of emotionally nurturing the child. And through that observation, they discovered that there was three primary um, ways of attaching to our primary caregiver, which reflected the way we bonded in intimate relationships as adults. So Mm -hmm. the three the three main ones are the secure attachment, which is, you know, parents or the caregiver that is very tuned in, very engaged, able to notice when they're making mistakes and do those repairs really, really quickly. And then there's the anxious attachment style, which is children that had, you know, maybe the parent was there for them sometimes emotionally, maybe they weren't. So there was always kind of like that flip flop, never knowing what to expect. And then there was the avoidantly attached, which is children that were fairly uh, left alone in their emotional experience and not really tended to, not enough eye contact, face-to-face, skin-to-skin interaction. Mm-hmm. And that created more of a, um, that kid to, 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 to stay more shut down as adults. As mm-hmm. a result. Yeah. I know which yeah. one I am. <laughs> Do you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely uh, an anxious attacher. For sure. So how do each of these manifest in later in life? So what does, what does this have to do, like, let's say, with our current marriages or our current relationships? How, what, is, what does it matter? Why do we need to know about this? Oh my gosh, Kate, it matters so much. It is probably the most helpful, um, helpful framework that I teach all my clients, and it is the basis of all of my work. So essentially, Mm -hmm. you know, that bond that we experience as kids, and I want want to make a quick note by this. There's a spectrum for these attachment styles. So as you're listening to this, you know, please make sure to know that we, we fit more into one attachment style, but it can also change. Well, as we are an adult with specific partners that can make us more anxious or make us more avoidant. So don't, please don't put Mm -hmm. yourself in a black and white box, but all definitely um, I want to encourage you to see which one you relate to the most so it can be more helpful for you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So the way that the the attachment styles help us is, so if we grew up with an anxious attachment with with our parents or caregiver, when we are in an adult relationship, we're going to be somebody that is going to be much more sensitive to um, feeling rejected, feeling abandoned, feeling threats to, you know, from outside people from the relationship. Just overall, we need much more reassurance and stability and um, comfort from our partner. 
there. Whereas somebody that's more avoidantly attached tends to need a lot more space in the relationship. They actually are so used to tending to themselves and, you know, regulating their own nervous system, even though that's not good for them to do, that's what they've been trained for years and years and years. So when somebody starts to get too close to them, they're their internal system starts to do things that pushes away connection and it can create insecurity in the relationship. But a lot of times they're not even aware that they're doing that. And the same way that somebody anxious is not aware that they're probably clinging really hard Mm. and they are pushing their partner away, but it happens so quickly and so automatically. Yes. Yes. Yes, it does. Yes. <laughs> I just, you know, from my own experience with this, I will say that I was such an anxious attacher. And before I knew um, that I was doing this or before I knew anything, and I, and I knew this before attachment styles became a thing, right? So mm-hmm. I did a lot of personal development and therapy and all of that work and sort of uncovered the reasons that I was anxiously attaching in such a sort of for lack of a better word, kind of crazy way, Mm. (laughs) right? Like when I would, because what tends to happen is you, you're getting triggered, right? And you're, and you're projecting your past hurts onto this person in front of you. Um, And it, in, in the extreme, like you said, it's a spectrum, right? So in the extreme, you know, if a guy didn't call me back on time, or if he was slightly late for a date, he would get the wrath of my entire childhood of waiting for my dad to show up when I was Mm. little, right? Like that's sort of what this is, um, what we're talking about here, right? Absolutely. I mean, completely. It's it's our, and especially as we get closer to someone in a relationship. So let's say you're just dating somebody and, you know, stuff is starting to surface, but as you even get more deeper and start to depend on someone and start to bond, that's when the shit really hits the fan. Yeah. Because we tend to our un- we co- tend to unconsciously attract or unconsciously choose people that mirror our bonding, right, or our lack thereof, right. So as a as an anxious attacher, I tend to be attracted to avoidant attachers, right. Absolutely. Which, yeah. So so actually, so let's, can you say a little bit about that? About how we end up choosing people that are just trigger this stuff in us all the time. It's it's remarkable how our brains are wired and mm-hmm. how we pair bond by recognition in the brain and you you said it so perfectly. If I'm anxious, I have all these internal fears and the way my nervous system is programmed so I'm not even in control of who my brain is picking out in a in a room full of people. I'm going to be attracted. My brain is literally going to go off like fireworks to recreate the same kind of experience that I had as a child. Mm-hmm. And, you know, without self reflection and without doing the like, had you not done that kind of work, or you know, obviously myself, had I not done this kind of work, we would continue to attract and stick around for those kind of relationships. Whereas when we intervene and just have that awareness, we're able to recognize, okay, uh uh-oh, my brain is firing up around this person. I know that my attachment style was not healthy growing up. So the likeliness of me being attracted to someone this much that is good for me is pretty, pretty small. Mm. So what do you do then, right? Because your brain is like revving on like high attachment here to somebody who's maybe not good for us. So then what, right? You have that. And this is, you know, I often talk about really putting space between our, um, our feelings and our reactions, right. Or, Or our, our internal reactions and our outward actions. And this is that space, right? This is where that space is necessary for us to go. Okay. I'm noticing this thing is happening right now. I also know that it's probably not very good for me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So what do you do? Oh man, it's such a perfectly, it's such a perfect, perfect question because that's, that's the work, right? You know, yeah. we, for the first part of the work is the recognition. Okay. What is my attachment style? What was the kind of relating and connection that I had as a child and which part of it was good for me and 
you know, healthy and connected, which part of it was I was, was not so healthy, where I may have been neglected or where I may have been um, not really met in the emotional needs that I, I needed to have responded to. So that's the first part of the work. And the second part is exactly what you're saying. Now that we know that this is what the, the way that we've been bonded and we're, we continue to be drawn to people that mirror those very unhealthy patterns, how do we start to choose differently in order to create a healthy and more connected relationship, right? Right. Yes. 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 And so it takes a while, you know, as people start to learn this work, it takes a while for, for those dots to start connecting. You know, the biggest piece is, um, you know, making sense of our story to really grieve some of the pain and some of the neglect and some of the abandonment, um, that we experience. It's allowing ourselves to feel those things that we, you know, maybe we didn't give ourselves permission or nobody really helped us, um, experience as little kids. And once we start to make space, you know, whether that's through journaling or working through you know, with a coach or a therapist or, uh, you know, listening to podcasts or listening to things that educate us. So now we can bring in, and I love that you said make space because you're, you're so right on. It's making space to not jump into something just because we have strong feelings about it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I want to back up for a second. How do we figure out? I mean, if it's not immediately obvious, right? If someone is listening to this podcast and they didn't go like I did, like I'm like, I know exactly what my attachment style is, but I also know because I've done, you know, tons of work for the last 20 years on this. But if you didn't immediately go, I know that's my attachment style. How do we find out? It's a great question. Absolutely. Yeah. Like sometimes what, what I'm hearing you say is it's more subtle, you know, it's not as black and white yeah. or we, or if we haven't done any kind of work, this might be feel very foreign, even just listening to this, you know? Yeah. So, so what I would say is if you, when, when you're in an intimate relationship with someone or even, you know, even with your close friends, cause if you're single and listening, this stuff comes up with, with your, with your really close friends as well. It's not just with your intimate partner, even though it does show up the most with somebody that you're more intimate with. Um, pay attention to if you if you feel like is it easy for you to make your needs known in relationships? Do you find it easy to respond to people's needs fairly easily? Are you tuned in to your partners or your friends' emotional experiences? Can you sense what's happening for them? Are you able to make repairs really quickly? And if you if you re- if you relate to that you most likely have a good sense of secure uh, attachment within you. And again, you can be 50% secure and 50% more avoidant. So you can still have a sense of a sense of that security as well. If you're somebody that gets really freaked out in relationship, you, you get frustrated when somebody is trying to get really close to you or wanting to know about your internal world. You're like, why the hell does this person, well, you know, why are they asking me all these things? <laughs> you know, why don't they yeah. understand that? I just need space. It's not personal. It's not about them. I just need this time to regulate myself, maybe process whatever is happening for me from the rest of my day. And you, you get more annoyed and frustrated when somebody is trying to get too close. That means that you have more of the avoidant uh, tendencies within you. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you're somebody that tends to want a lot of closeness, like you want to know what's happening for your partner, but to a, not in a, in a, a general way, but in a very, ex- more in an extreme way, like I really want to feel closeness. I want to do a lot with my partner. I want, um, you know, I have a hard time asking for my needs directly. I usually act out, whether it's with anger or complaining or blaming. And it's hard for me to just let my partner know, hey, this is what I need because I'm so terrified of being abandoned. Mm-hmm. So I almost put on more of a mask, which exasperates the symptoms even more. Yeah. Yeah. No, does that make sense? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And there are there are a bunch of tests that you can take online, right? Is there is there one that you recommend? Like, the, if you just Google what's my attachment style, there's tons of tons of them, right? 
I actually have a really great one that a, um, a doctor a friend of mine did. We can link it to this. Oh, if you good. Know. Yeah, let's. That's it. perfect. And you yeah. can actually take the test. If you're in a relationship, you can see, by answering some of the questions, you could see what your partner is too. Mm-hmm. So it can give you a better sense of how to approach a partner. Because, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about attachment work, it's we're really focused on ourselves. You know, we're thinking about how we get our needs met, how what we need to do to take care of ourselves. But there's another person in the equation. And if... Yeah. If we don't approach our uh, our partner carefully, we're going to trigger and uh, bring up all these things that are going to make them feel so dysregulated, and now they're not going to want to be around us after a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because obviously my audience is a lot of people who are you know either trying to figure out whether or not to stay in or leave their marriages. Yeah. Um, and you know we we've, we've talked about if you you know have these feelings across a crowded room, you should probably the red flags should be going up really quickly and you might want to run for the hills. Yes. <laughs> but like what if you're already in the relationship? Yeah. What do you do then? Yeah, that's and the the great thing about these attachment styles is that if both partners are committed to doing the work and they're both committed to bringing some awareness to their to the way that they are they were programmed you can create a secure functioning relationship with all all of these all the mixtures yeah um, the you know are there certain pairings that make it more challenging of course you know somebody that's more avoidant with somebody that's anxious that are a little bit higher on the spectrum, they're going to have to do a little bit more work to, um, to, to, to start bringing in new habits that are very counterintuitive for them on both sides. On both sides, exactly. On both right? sides. Somebody yeah. that's more anxious needs to really learn to, who you know, check their assumptions. And just because they feel triggered to not assume that that's actually happening, to get curious about their partner rather than leading with blame. Or what I like to say is, look, I mean, honestly, I screw this stuff up constantly. I just make sure I repair, you know, I'm like, okay, I, you know, I got in your space. I totally see how this was triggering for you. Um, I want you to know that I see what I did, mm-hmm. you know, validating my partner for his attachment style constantly. Whereas I make sure to make my own uh, needs a priority in the relationship too. You know, one of the things I say in my relationship with my partner, I have um, a combination and obviously if I'm doing a lot of work, I'm mostly secure, but I have a little both. I have some avoidant and I have some anxious. Mm -hmm. And I knew from, you know, being in past relationships, not hearing from my partner all day was really triggering for me. By the time it was nighttime, I was a hot mess. (laughs) I was like, oh my God, I was angry and frustrated. I'm like, "Ah!" but I had to communicate that this time around. I had to learn from what didn't work. And, you know, pretty early on. So those of you that are listening, I really want to encourage you, even in the early stage of dating, make your needs known, you know, make them known very, very quickly, casually, but owning them. And I let my partner know, you know, I really need a phone call every morning. It's really important for me to feel connected. It makes me feel relaxed the rest of the day. And then I can feel free to just, you know, do my own thing. And then you can do your own thing, you know, but I, I really need that, you know, and it was uncomfortable to have to say those things, but it made such a difference to just, you know, be just more direct rather than beating around the bush about this. Yeah. And this is one of those things where, you know, women, I think women are, I don't know if men are, I don't know if there's, if women are worse about this than men or not, but you know, often I'll hear women say like, well, he should just know, Mm. he should just know that I need him to whatever it is. Right. And you, you know, my, I always say you are not entitled to anything that you can't ask for mm. and that you have got to be able, we have, our first step is understanding ourselves like we've been talking about, right? And the second step yeah. is being able to communicate that to a partner, you know, and the third step is to be able to receive it from a partner, you know, because it's not, that. right? We have to be able to say, hey, I really need a phone call from you every morning because if we don't get a phone call, we get really angry. But if we haven't asked for it, how the hell is he supposed to know? Yeah. Right? Especially if they're attached differently where they have completely fundamentally different needs. They may need the exact opposite of what you need. So of course they don't know that that's what you need. Exactly. And that's, and that's where the, that's where stretching and growing, I think that's where the, um, 
that's where sort of the real work of relationships kind of comes in, right? Because it's really easy to be like, hey, I need a I need a phone call in the morning to someone who also has an anxious attachment style or secure and is like, okay, cool, I'll do that. But if you have an if your partner is avoidant, it's actually a stretch for them to be able to provide that for you. Huge, huge yeah. stretch. And I want to yeah. emphasize ex- I, you, what you're yeah. saying is so right on the money. Yeah. And it's, you know, you're not entitled to it, but if you make it known how important it is to you, and if he is really invested in loving you the way that you need to be loved, and you're able to clearly communicate the way that you need to be loved, then he's going to, he's going to want to do that for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the asking, the owning of owning what we need, why that's such an important uh, first step is because if, if we don't do that, we're going to project everything and the other person is going to make the other person feel so pushed away and so turned off. And so again, for something that they are not aware of. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, not only do we not end up getting our needs met because of that, we, we, it, it, it reaffirms that story about ourself. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. I'm always reminded in these conversations of this guy that I dated when I was, I think, like 27. Mm. I was a hot mess at 27. Mm. And so in the throes and like at the mercy of my issues and had done no personal development work yet. And mm. I... This poor guy, I don't even remember his name. I wish I remembered his name just so that I could call him and apologize. You know? He was this great guy and he kept sort of inviting me out to do stuff. Mm. Um, what I wanted was to go on a one-on-one date with him, but he was inviting me to go see music. He was inviting me to a friend's party. He was, inv- I mean, he was inviting me places where I was obviously, you know, on display meeting people and stuff, but I wanted to, I wanted to go on a date with him. And after this like happening three or four times and never expressing what I wanted, I went off on the guy. Mm. And I vomited all of my projections, all of my insecurities, all of my, you know, I'm not good enough and you don't want to be with me in private. And if you can't like ask me on a date, then I mean, I can't even tell you Mm. how, and this poor guy was just so blindsided and probably was like, this woman is crazy. You know, really? Cause I kind of was right. It was kind of, you know, it's a, it's a terrible, um, sort of distillation of the experience, right? For me, like it, it didn't, I didn't feel crazy. I felt really rational and yeah. really justified in my ire. But, you know, from his point of view, he'd never, I'd never asked him nicely for anything mm-hmm. different. <laughs> and know? I almost wonder even on like a really uh, subconscious level, level, I wonder if you were picking up that he was more avoidant because what happens is people that are more avoidant tend to have a harder time doing that one-to-one face-to-face connection. They almost need to do activities where they can like have like a third thing. Yeah. Like a buffer. Exactly. Where they can connect to you. If there's a third thing there, it helps their nervous system really relax. But for right. you, you're wanting that one-on-one connection. So for you, like, what the hell? Like I need more, give me your face to face here, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And if, you know, and neither of us had the words for it. Neither of us had the experience or the maturity. And so it was not going to be a conversation, you know, and that's, but I, but I do think that so many people go through their entire relationships repeating that exact kind of dynamic or conversation, Mm. you know, where one person is just furious at the other for not showing up the way that they need them to. And the other person is completely bewildered (laughs) by what you're talking about. What the hell is going on? I didn't hear you freaking out on me. I don't get it. (laughs) Right? It's so upsetting. We assume that if if I feel disconnected, you must feel disconnected too. So why the hell aren't you saying anything about it? You know? Why are you not noticing that there's so much disconnect between us right now? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... It's interesting because when you were describing an avoidant attachment style, it almost sounded um, introverted. You know, it almost sounds like introvert versus extrovert. 
It does. Yeah. It um, does sound like that. How much is that? How much of, of that do you think is true? Like are introverted people necessarily avoidant and extroverted people necessarily more anxious or is it just, a, is that a separate thing? You know, I don't really know too much about the differences between introvert and extroverted other than the fact that introverts need to process internally yeah. and extroverts have to kind of get everything out out loud and process yeah. more externally. Yeah. Those are the those are the main differences that that I'm aware of with with the two kinds of um with the introvert and extrovert. Mm -hmm. But I think for, for avoidance, it's more, they'll go internal and they'll stay internal. Whereas I think uh, introverts will process and then they'll be able to and connect. Able to. Yeah, exactly. exactly. They'll, they'll, okay. Now that I've had my time to process, I'm coming back to you and I want to share it with you rather than somebody that's avoided. Doesn't, Again, somebody that is really avoidant and hasn't done any kind of work will process all their stuff, but they won't really disclose it to somebody because they don't want to bring somebody into their inner yeah. world. There's too yeah. much shame and discomfort. I mean, think about it. This is a child that had to process and regulate and, you know, m basically we're like little adults. You know, yeah. and it's, so it makes me really sad when I think about, you know, people that are, you know, avoidant and anxious. And of course I have both of those within myself, but I tend to lean a little bit more on avoidantly attached. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, left more alone. They, they tend to have a really hard time thinking that somebody really wants to know about them. They feel like it feels yeah. really threatening and uncomfortable. So if you're with somebody that is more avoidant, if you can just have that empathy and awareness in your mind that they're not doing this on purpose to create distance, but th that this is really hard for them and that they want to be close to you in just the same way that you do, but they need to be approached a little bit more gently. They need to have more space in the relationship. And if you can be on their side with helping them, like for example, you know, they need more transition time after a day of work. They can't just go from being alone to being with people easily. They need a little bit of a buffer or some kind of, um, you know, some time by themselves to prepare them to enter more of a, a social or relating kind of environment. Whereas people that are anxious, they're always ready for that connection. If anything, yeah. they're wanting that so much that they often can take it from really unhealthy places that are not good for them. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, something that I found find really interesting about this or all, all human relationships, right, is that we don't get to say like, well, I'm avoidant, so. Yeah. Right? Or, well, I'm anxious, so. Right? We're, we're actually trying to create, this isn't just about us. Yeah. This is about creating healthy relationships, right? And so there is, there's a give and take with that, right? Like you can't just be like, well, I don't do that because I'm an avoidant attached yeah. person. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's okay. more like, I, I'm so sorry that I'm avoidantly attacked and I know how hurtful that must feel for you sometimes. Mm. You know, I know that sometimes I go away and I have to reflect by myself and I hate that I have to leave you alone. I can't just connect as easily as I want to you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that makes, you know, and then there's like, a, there's, then there's compromise, right? Then there's, um, I know you need something different. How can we both work together to figure out what would feel best for both of us? Mm. Right. Absolutely. Like, yeah, I know you need the time and I also need the connection. So can we set it up so that, you know, you have, is an hour enough? you know, or can you, can you come home from work and ha take an hour and then can we please be together or what, you know, where's the, where's the middle ground, right? Absolutely. And it takes two willing partners. I hear so much. Uh, I have a lot of clients whose husbands will say, well, this is who I am. You knew that when you married me. And it's like, well, there's no conversation. <laughs> no, there's doesn't. That's not. That's not how to be in relationship with another person. Yeah. Right. And the number one. The number one thing. Men, based on John Gottman's research, mm. a man not being influenceable by his woman is is like a setup for the relationship to fail. Mm, yeah. Yeah. A man not being influenceable by his, I love that word. by his woman, by his woman, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so to 
to hear a need and not be able to give into it or um, change his behavior in service of a woman that he loves is the number one sign that it's, it's a no go. Yeah. For, from the men's perspective, I'm from, from the female's perspective, if she doesn't feel like she can influence him when she's having things come up and needs come up for her, that will slowly deteriorate the relationship. And you know what? I like to use the framing. It's not even for her. It's for the relationship because the relationship won't survive if, you know, it's different if we're not going to be able to be there for our partner's needs all the time. It's impossible. But imagine saying, you know, honey, I can't, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be able to do that. I have this thing, but let me sit with you. Are you okay? How can I comfort you? How can I show you that I still care about you even though I can't do this thing? You know, it's like, that's what we're looking for. We're not, we don't need someone to rearrange everything. Right. Exactly. Just a little acknowledgement and compassion for what it is that we do need, even if the need can't be fulfilled. Yes. 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 And on the flip side, Kate, for for women, you know, the same way that women are looking to be able to influence their men, you know, because men tend to carry the sense of burden just mm. in general, like life is a burden, work is a burden, relationship is a burden. You know, most every yeah. man I talk to experiences this. And I think it's just evolutionary. They're wired in this way. Mm-hmm. Women value connection just across the board differently than men. Men value status. They value being able to provide. They have a different sense of mm-hmm. their priorities are in a different place. And I think, you know, the number one thing, and again, this is based on John Gottman's research is yeah. if a woman can take a little bit of responsibility for what she's bringing to him, just a little bit that can really help him be able to hear her more clearly so he doesn't feel like he's constantly being blamed or attacked and feel like he's just a bad guy all the time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So what would that look like? I have a lot of practice at this because I was terrible at doing this for so long. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) And I still do it terribly sometimes. I'm like, why haven't you learned, Sylvie? Just go apologize right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it means like, you know, I know you, it's, it's seeing that they have good intention. It's, I, I know you didn't do this thing to hurt me, but it feels really bad. I feel really bad right now. And even there's a part of me that really does want to blame you. And I know that's not going to be a good thing. A part of me wants to run out the door and I'm not going to do that, but I want to just let you know that there has to be something in this that I contributed to. I don't see it, but I know that there has to be present. Can you help me now? Can you help me with this? What, I mean, what a gorgeous relationship that would be, right? Like, if, yeah, <laughs> I know. And it's so hard because we just want to hold on to being right all the time. All <laughs> the time. It's so, it's just so not helpful. <laughs> yeah. It takes a lot of practice to, to, to build our humility muscle a lot. Exactly. And it's, and it's hard to be the first one out of the corner. I think that's really, especially people in long-term relationships where this stuff has been going wrong for a long time. It's hard to be the first one out of the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. But one of the things I like to say with that is if we can be the one to model that kind of vulnerability for a while, like five, six, seven times in a row, Mm -hmm. then we have so much more we have so much more influence with our partner. You know, if I'm the one that's kind of willing to do that a few times and then I step back and I'm observing, is my partner meeting me in any of this? Are they are they showing any desire to call themselves out as, all, as, as much as I am trying. And if after a while you're doing this and you're modeling this and you're being humble and you're apologizing and your partner is still not showing up, that's where the second part of my work, which is equally value, valuable, which is boundaries, has yes. to be present. Yes. So let's... Has to. Perfect segue, Sylvie. Yay. <laughs> so let's go, let's talk about boundaries. Let's talk about what that would look like, right? Because that's really vulnerable. Like, oh my God, I've done this seven times and he's not meeting me on the court. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. So that would be okay. Having a conversation with our partner. Um, you know, honey, I'm realizing that I've been really trying in these last few months. I don't know if you're aware that I've been trying or if you've noticed that I've been doing anything differently, but I, I have been, I've been really, you know, trying to approach you differently without blaming you, without attacking you, you know, trying to take responsibility and really showing up vulnerably. And I'm feeling like I'm not really being met there. Mm-hmm. And so I want to I want to have a conversation about that. And first seeing how they respond if there's still the def- cuz obviously even in that there was no blaming, there was no attacking. I'm sh- I'm sharing what I've been doing and I'm giving feedback to what I'm noticing without saying you didn't do this or you yes. didn't do that, right? Yep, you're keeping it in I language. I yes. feel like I'm not being met as yes. opposed to you're not meeting me. You're a shitty partner, okay? You're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me, I'm doing all this and you <laughs> suck. <laughs> I'm a better partner than you. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and paying attention, what do they say? Do they acknowledge, oh, wow, I, I don't even realize. I, you know, I totally noticed that you've been doing things differently and I really love that. I'm noticing that you, you know, I feel really less attacked and you've been showing up. Um, and are they, are they with us in that? Or are they getting defensive? You know, well, this is the way that it's supposed to be. And I'm not doing anything wrong. If your partner is approaching you from that defensive place after you've made multiple effort, you have to do something about that. That is where your boundary is now being violated. And now you are not actually, um, advocating the relationship that person is taking unknowingly. Of course, they're not doing this on purpose, but we all take advantage where we can. It's just human nature, you know, Mm -hmm. and whether it's getting a therapist or a coach or, you know, doing a program together that can help them see what they're not bringing. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I like that you talked about the boundary, not, not so much as a a do not go, but also a, where you're inviting them to go right? That you have yes. opened a door to say, please walk, please walk through this with me. And their refusal to walk through it is actually violating a boundary, which is, which yes. is different from how we normally perceive of boundaries as being like the fence that holds things back or in or whatever, right? Yes. More harsh and a little bit, I can almost feel like ultimatum-y. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. And eventually, it, you know, the second stage of the boundary, so if that's still happening and they're not, you know, showing up, they're still not willing, the second stage would be, wow, I'm starting to really notice I'm shutting down in my body with you. You know, I'm really, I'm really seeing myself pull back. I'm, you know, I really don't like that. I don't want that to happen, Mm -hmm. but I'm really noticing that, um, I feel a little little unsafe here, you know, and, and it is going to have a reaction in your body. You are going to feel unsafe if you start to really tune in and give yourself permission to even grieve a little bit of that, because that will help us make decisions to allow somebody to stay in our life if they're genuinely showing up in the work with us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's key, right? I mean, that is the key that whether they're showing up in the work with us. Yeah. Because if they're not, there's, there's very little hope for change. There is no relationship. It's a one-sided, lopsided, um, power is just not, it's just not balanced. It's not equal. And you, you can't survive. You know, I think we're either one or the other, you know, either we, we are the ones that are, we're being very vulnerable. And you know, that's, this is what I tend to find with people that are a little bit more anxiously attached because they have that fear of being abandoned. They tend to overshare, over vulnerable, continue to expose themselves over and over again. But honestly, even in really unhealthy ways into people that aren't necessarily safe. And their practice is actually making room for space and actually paying attention to if they're being met instead of filling up those spaces all the time, you know, making boundaries for yourself and recognizing, okay, whew, I have actually shared a lot with this person. Have they? Are they meeting me? Are they, and, and pointing that out if they're not, rather than continuing to overshare, which it just bond, it, re, it bonds us to somebody that may not be able to give us what we really need. Yeah, and it's a false bond too, and, right? Because it's yeah. they're not they're not receiving. <laughs> they're just sort of they're maybe taking it and filing it away or whatever, but they're not really receiving it. 
Exactly. And they're not, re- they're not doing it in a way that's connecting back to you. So it's like, right. you are left alone in that you are being abandoned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Does that, does that resonate Kate? Oh, it resonates so much. Cause I've, I've done this in the past, you know, where I've shared things and I, and you know, it's not quite being acknowledged or even received or, or connected to, or, you know, questioned or anything. Right. And then, and then because you're sort of chasing that bond, Mm -hmm. then you share, I would share more the next time and then share more the next time. And then it's true. Right. And then you notice like, Oh, wow. It's not being reciprocated. Mm -hmm. It's not even being uh, received really. It's sort of like a fly ball, right? Mm, (laughs) Totally. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. No, that resonates so much for me. That is for sure. And it just gives us, it's like sometimes the person in front of us doesn't even realize that most of the time they don't realize they're doing that. So if we can set that, you know, inviting kind of boundary and what a boundary is just a matter of protecting ourselves and our energy and the relationship with whoever we're relating with and letting them know, you know, I'd love to know more about you. You know, I'm, I'm realizing that I've shared a lot, but I don't really know much about you. And I'm really curious. And I, I think you're such an interesting person. Would you mind sharing more, especially on the first few dates? Yeah. You know, these are tools that you guys can, you know, people can use to, mm-hmm. to create more of that balance. Um, just to see if there is how we're being met. Somebody that's more avoidant that has done no work around that will probably freak out and, you know, maybe not call the person back after that, which is okay. Right. It's a good thing. It is. It's great. It's so much, it's information, right? It's like, oh, okay. I often find this too. I think that um, I I know some people who are great conversationalists Mm. Because, or they appear to be great conversationalists because they're always asking you questions and they're, they, they appear really curious and really interested. And I notice that these are people who are deliberately, often deliberately keeping the focus off themselves. Mm. Right. And it mm. seems like they're curious and interested and in keeping the conversation moving, but really what they're doing is keeping the conversation moving away from themselves. Yeah. Right. Uh, They're not exposing their own vulnerability. They're wanting to know more about you. And they generally, genuinely may want all of those things. But like you said, it's not, it's not balanced in an equal way where you're sharing, they're sharing, you're sharing, they're sharing. No, they're just, you know, and I have, I have trouble with this because, you know, I'm a therapist, so I'm always asking questions. So I have my, my stretch and my edge is the opposite of yours where, you know, you're saying you share a lot. I'm like, I have a hard time sharing at all. I'm like, oh my God, how do you share? You know, so <laughs> it's so fascinating that it's so important for each of us to know our own edge and where yeah. we need to stretch. And, you know, sometimes like when I, when I don't feel like I'm sharing, of course I want to, but it's, it's such a challenge to even know what that looks like or if it can feel so vulnerable and can bring up shame and discomfort, but that's where we grow and that's where we actually create a more balanced and secure functioning relationship and letting our partner know, Hey, you know what? Instead of you don't ask questions about me. Hey, I have a really hard time sharing. Can you maybe, you know, ask questions sometimes or help me with that? Because I'd love to feel more seen and known in this relationship, you know? Mm, Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's so beautiful. What happens when you, communicate directly, ask for help, right? In sort of a vulnerable way yeah. and, um, and not blame. Yeah. It's like a little, like a flower just opening in bloom, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, and taking the pressure off of ourselves to do it perfectly when we're triggered. Cause I find that, you know, me, myself included, me, myself included, me included, and you know, me, myself, and I, and myself, <laughs> and everybody, and everybody else beside me, <laughs> and everyone else that I work with, you know, when we're triggered, we, when we fight and we need to take a break and come back and acknowledge those things, you know, so you don't feel like you always have to do it perfect the first time around, which is just, it's just not realistic. It's not yeah. helpful. And it's, and it is a practice, right? It really is. We've been doing this one way for so long. And I think that often, you know, as coaches and therapists, we sort of present a way of communicating that is so completely foreign to most or many relationships that, that it takes a while. We have to, I think we have to 
you know, add that, that it takes practice to get there, that it's not going to be the first time out of the gate. You're not going to get it right. And that's okay. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. If you can notice even a small little shift in your behavior or just even in your awareness and you're willing to make new choices from that place, that is huge. It takes about four years to build a secure attachment style once you're doing the work. So it does take time. And I think it's very unhelpful. You know, as a culture, we have a lot of transformational work that, you know, stresses this, take this weekend and transform. And yeah. it's so damaging and can re-traumatize us. Like you said, yeah. we've been doing it this way for our whole life for years. How could we possibly expect to just shift this overnight? Right. Yes, yes, yes. Amen, sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so with you on that. Absolutely. You, one of the things that you also specialize in is family cultures. Mm -hmm. And you uh, are originally from the Middle East. So how does this, how, how do you see this uh, influ being influenced by culture, uh, cultural influences or how, how do they affect our attachment styles? Do you, so, yes. So when I was in grad school, we had a whole semester on culture, you know, yeah. out of the whole two years, a whole entire semester. And I, at first, I didn't really quite understand why there was so much of this push and this focus. Yeah. But after we started to really dive into it, you know, our culture makes up our lens, the lens in which we see everything and relationships included. And so, you know, I'll use my own background as an example. Middle Eastern, we it comes with, you know, gender roles. It comes with, um, you know, how people view marriage, what age you should get married, and how many, you know, so many different things. How sexuality is viewed in the culture, mm. how conflict is viewed in in, in your culture. Mm -hmm. So if we start to tease apart all the layers that are under the umbrella of culture, your partner probably, if they didn't grow up in the same one as you, has a completely different experience of life with their lens of their culture than you do. And when I work with couples that are, you know, uh, coming from two different cultural backgrounds, you can see, you can imagine how much conflict that can bring without those, without knowing each other's maps and having awareness around that stuff. Yeah. Huge. 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 I mean, this, it can be a, as big as the attachment styles as a deal breaker if we don't know why our partner does certain things or make effort to understand, huh, you know, certain um, English cultures like from, you know, Britain and they don't really uh, exude anger in, in certain ways. Whereas the Middle Eastern culture is really good with grieving. They have a, you know, I've noticed that they have a really, like even if you go to a, a funeral of somebody that has a, you know, Middle Eastern descent, they are sobbing and exuding such a powerful ability to vent and release the pain. Whereas in a lot of cultures that might be a little bit um, foreign, you know, or yeah. an American culture, Culture, there's so much focus on pleasure and self and you know that does not exist in a lot of cultures so knowing those things and being able to talk about it and not making each other's version wrong is so important yeah that's just so important it's such a it's such a critical piece of the pie relationships end up being this sort of like this, like a stew, right? Like just like all of this stuff put in and you have to, at some point be able to separate out the ingredients and say like, okay, what's affecting what here? Yeah. Right. Abs absolutely. And some things that are in the, our stew that we grew up with are not always relationship uh, conducive. You know, they're not always healthy for relationships. So yeah. we have to be willing to, you know, question certain things that maybe we were raised with and see, okay, this is the way that I've done it up until now and it makes sense and it's going to be really hard to work through this and shift this. But this is not a healthy behavior. I, and I could see that this is, can really affect my relationship with my partner if I don't do some work around this. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to just sort of go back to attachment styles. What, what do you think that people are most surprised by when they learn about their attachment styles? Hmm. What are they most surprised by? I think they're, they're, they're so surprised by how deeply rooted they are. You know, something that took place 
as infants for us and the way we were bonded, that it could have such a dramatic impact on the way we relate to someone is as an adult. Yeah. And it can be, it can make or break your relationship without that awareness. And people yeah. are shocked. They're like, oh my God, I, I do this, I do this, I do this. And I had no idea this is why. Yeah. Um, I sort of want to tell a quick story about that. If that's Please. okay. okay. I, um, I had a boyfriend once who was just one of the greatest loves of my life. Hmm. Um, and he had a very avoidant attachment style. And it turned out that he's Catholic. And he was uh, the third of seven and children. Wow. And his mom was, you know, kind of churning out babies for a period of time there. And he, she had him quite quickly after his older sister and then had his younger brother quite quickly after him. And he was actually, as an infant, was given away to his aunt to be mm -hmm. raised mm -hmm. um, for the first two years of his life. And so he had no attachment. He yeah. didn't really bond. I don't know what his situation was with his aunt, but certainly not to his mother um, because she was still breastfeeding the one before and then had to start breastfeeding the new one, never breastfed him. And it was the thing that destroyed us mm. because he was completely unable to work through his avoidance and meet me uh, anywhere on the court. I mean, it was so, and he loved me. He was so desperately in love with me and he so badly wanted to, you know, change, but he also wasn't willing to really, he actually wasn't ultimately willing to change, you know, like, um, and it's, and it's, it was so tragic. I mean, it was really, you know, the greatest heartbreak of my life, but mm. Yeah, there was just something you said about that that was, you know, about, about, yeah, it's surprising that it's like, wow, that his, the fact that he was so unattached as an infant could come full circle when he was, you know, in his 50s. That was, yeah, tragic. Absolutely. absolutely. And it's not like as we grow older, it gets softer without doing the work. It doesn't change, you know? Exactly. The only thing that does change is our defenses start to thin out as we get older. So we might actually feel more of those things that we, we may have suppressed or been more, you know, we have defenses where our needs were not met or where we were hurt. And as we get older, we, we soften those things, those defenses soften. So we actually feel a lot of the stuff that we didn't deal with. So it can get more intense. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, what do you think is the hardest part for people when they first discover that they're anxious or avoidant? The hardest part um, is having to feel what's actually there. You know, like somebody that's avoidant has to sit with the thoughts that they have about their partner that are not good all the time. You know, people that are avoidant tend to see a lot of their partner's flaws as a way to create distance. So they have these negative thoughts about their partner and they can, can make them feel super guilty or just horrible that they're having these kind of feelings and thoughts and having to sit through that. Um, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of willingness. And, you know, whereas somebody that is really anxious the hard part is they have to sit and feel and grieve how they were abandoned and how they were intended to. And that's really painful, you know, yeah. but what's, what's on the other side of that, of course, is our freedom and is our ability to, mm -hmm. it gets softer and it, it, we get more comfortable when we get triggered. It's not, it's yes. Okay. That thing's happening. It's not the end of the world, you know? Right. Yeah. There's only, there's only room for growth in it. It's, we can spend our lives avoiding it, but ultimately it's the, it's the key to happiness and it's the key to intimacy and it's the key to health, healthy relationships. 100%. And you know, the, the key is through, through this whole conversation is really owning, you know, owning our own side of the street, owning our needs, but also making sure we choose somebody who really is, is really open to doing the same. That's so important. It's just, there's no possibility without that. There really isn't. It's so true. 
It is yeah. so true. Um, I have a feeling that might this might that might be the answer to this question, which is what do you want people to most take away from this conversation? Ah. <laughs> We're intuitively already picking up on each other. Yeah, I think you are just answered that really, right? <laughs> I think so, really. Yeah, it's owning, you know, really owning you're owning own. what your sensitivities are, making effort to work through them as much as you can and you know, to, to call yourself out. If it ha- if it shows up in the relationship, if you do things that pushes your partner away, just own it. Just, you know, just speak to it. Allow your limitations to be a part of your relationship without it reflecting your self-esteem. And that's so important. I love that. Allow your limitations to be a part of the relationship. Cause so often it's the, those are the things that we're trying to hide and that's what gets us into the most trouble. It's so much trouble. Oh my God, the relationship is doomed. Mm -hmm. And if we just actually allow them to be part of it, like we're all good (laughs) for the most part, right? And and it's that beginning stage. So give yourself space. Let the, you know, it's going to be hard in the beginning to, to, to recognize these things about yourself. It can trigger, you know, some anxiety and sadness and just know that that's okay. And that's part of the journey and you will get, it will get easier as you, Mm -hmm. as you own this part of yourself more and more. Yes. I want to encourage everybody to follow Sylvie on Instagram. I, I'm obsessed with Sylvie's Instagram. <laughs> I have to hold my back, myself back from sharing everything. Um, and so you can, there's a, her link to that is in the show notes. Is there anything else, parting, parting words that you want to say to anybody, Sylvie? No, I mean, that's it. I want to thank you, Kay, for this beautiful conversation. I mean, it's everything flows so naturally and we're so right on the same page with all of this. So I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for bringing me on. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your wisdom and for doing this work. It is, I think, some of the most important work that anyone can possibly do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. You can find me over at kateanthony.com and be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. See you next time.